or morning. You know, I've probably filmed this over the past week, um, either when I'm bored getting my IV um, or elsewhere. I, I probably filmed like a little update three, four times, five times. I've watched it back and I've deleted it. Um, Self-conscious, neurotic, and I wonder to myself, do people really want to hear what's going on in your life? Like, like, not my efforts in Ukraine, but like what's going on with me personally, or my views. And I say to myself, I think that's really self-indulgent. Uh, so I delete it as I'm self-conscious. But I wanted to, the reality is some people do care. You know, this is not gonna get 250,000 views like a reel. Of, but there's, I'm really blessed with some people who care and love me. Um, I've not corresponded with many people on social media like I used to. Uh, sometimes I'm sad about that, but it also makes me feel, um, yeah, I don't have the mental energy like I used to. Uh, I've been on caudal steroids and other things they don't tell me uh, what they are for IVs for 20 some days. Uh, the hole in my eardrum is more or less sealed up. I, Believe it or not, I'm, I might even hear better. I, I don't know. Um, but what I wanted to talk about, um, PTSD. Now, I get really offended when people say, do you have PTSD? You need to compress, decompress. I can kind of buy that from friends of mine, from the army, veterans. Um, but I can't really buy that from the civilian population. Um, but I've read up a bit about PTSD. And um, yeah, some of the symptoms. Sometimes I don't sleep that well. Uh, that could ha have to do with a traumatic brain injury. So there's, there's insomnia. Uh, I've talked to friends about that. Uh, one of the guys from Dark Horse here, uh, we've talked to great detail about this. But you know, some nights I wake up in a rage, an absolute rage, and I wanna kill somebody. And that anger is generated, directed towards one person. Uh, and I have a lot of the symptoms of PTSD, but it's not maybe what you might think. See, before, when I started Instagram, slightly before that, um, I was involved in the Zaporizhia Front with Hospitalers. Um, and there were some very, very bloody days. Um, Ukraine doesn't quote casualty numbers, but I'm gonna take a chance here. Um, and I only found out the figure on a, on a certain day in May, at a point I was working, uh, we had 63 300s. And that was anywhere from gunshot wounds, abdominal uh, amputations. And I wanna guess anywhere between 20 to 30, 200s dead. Um, th there was a good point of the day where I was just stacking bodies. That doesn't bother me. The first dead, uh, the first dead on arrival in our ambulance, that didn't bother me on the day. The next day was quiet uh, and we we're living in the house we were in. I was like a menopausal woman. See, everybody that night on the drive back down to the point from the hospital was dead quiet. And I was laughing, joking, you know. We were even uh, singing a song, Another One Bites the Dust, uh, when we were cleaning the ambulance. Yeah. That's probably quite sick. But the next day, I was like a menopausal woman. I was okay. And I'm sitting, watching YouTube on my shitty 3G. And, and then I'd have time to think. And I, and I start crying like a little woman. But I'm okay with that. Uh, Solodar, which is quite famed now, and there's many people doing evacuations there now, and, and which is great. Um, that wasn't that bad. Like when people talk about the constant shelling, even to this day, like I know people who were there when I was there, it's not that, I mean, it's, it's not good, but it's not, um, I've seen worse. I've seen a lot worse. Um, but regardless, what I really think I have PTSD about, and, and there's a lot of foreign volunteers who come here who are high functioning people, uh, like my friend Rebecca, perfect example as a nurse. 
it's some of the people we deal with here. That's where I have PTSD. Um, high functioning people are everywhere in the world. There's Ukrainians, there's Americans, there's British, but we also have a lot of lazy British, a lot of lazy Americans, lazy Dutch, lazy Swedes. You know, like this is, this is, this is one of the debate of our times, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in social welfare systems. Um, I don't want to get political, but in Ukraine, there's a lot of lazy, stupid pieces of shit. Like, and it's, it's really frustrating, you know? Um, I've been able to deal with this better than most foreign volunteers who I've met here. Um, but there's some useless, lazy fucking cunts. Um, and a lot of my rage, a lot of my PTSD is directed towards one woman. Um, my commander, my former ambulance commander, and I don't think she's going to watch this. I'm not trying to pick a fight with her or anybody. Um, she was a 28-year-old woman that was a qualified paramedic. Uh, she'd been wounded in the Donbass in 2017. Uh, had to have plastic surgery, different things. And it was her first rotation back to command a crew with her boyfriend, partner, as the driver. Uh, there was me, there was Dima, there was Edouard. Um, and I don't want to slag her completely because there's unwillingness and there's inability. And it was a combination of the two. Um, when we went on rotation for a month working in a hospital, um, you know, she would fill out casualty cards. She didn't do any of the hands-on work. Uh, so I'm maybe the least qualified, a TCCC medic, uh, which is for point of injury. So, so I, I, I had to learn, I had to learn a lot of new things in the hospital and there wasn't a lot of help from her, but most of it came from a couple Ukrainian doctors posted at the hospital, uh, Edouard, who's a be beautiful human being, uh, my, my first war wife. And what happened, cause I didn't speak the language and I learned very quickly when ambulances would come into that hospital, I needed to be on the casualty right from the beginning, uh, right from the handover. So they would go to the, the first hospital, to the Russian line, like actual hospital, and then they go on to Zaporizhia, they go on to Dnipro. And sometimes Dima, who's an anesthesiologist student, he would, uh, if, if, if the uh, casualty wasn't stable, he would go all the way to Zaporizhia with them and come back. Um, they call those runs, I guess, like when patient transports, uh, even American uh, paramedics tell me that's the most boring thing, you know, because you're just sitting in an ambulance just watching someone and probably nothing's going to happen. But, but you know, Dima used to go to Zaporizhia. She would fill out the casualty cards, which is good. But I would just try to plug in. And through plugging in, um, pharmacology, which I had no idea about, uh, in Cyrillic, I started drawing up ampules to prepare for concussions, uh, to prepare probably about five, six different drugs. I knew the dosages. I, I knew if we were getting casualties coming, uh, what would generally be needed. That, that was something proactive. But I would just work on the casualties. It's a simple algorithm. They get in, get them in, uh, cut their clothes off, cut around, get their documents, get their phones out, separate, make sure that's safe. Uh, get things like grenades and guns off them, uh, which sometimes weren't removed in the chaos. Um, but it, it came to the point, working with a young surgeon, Igor, who didn't speak a word of English or Ukrainian, um, we were doing surgery together. Uh, I would hold the hemostats, he would hold the scalpel. So, so this is a great thing for me, you know, like five, ten casualties a day. It's a horrible thing. But I was learning, I was learning. I'd never given an IV before Ukraine. Um, with Edouard, uh, I was preparing all the concussion people um, and giving them their IVs. And, uh, you know, it takes practice, it takes a feel for the veins. I was doing really well with that. One day, I blew a vein on some colonel. No big deal. People blow veins all the time. The ambulance commander, you can't do that. You're incompetent. You know, she's doing fuck all, but I, I'm trying. Um, so th that was the end of me giving IVs. After 10, 20, 30 successes, blow one vein, th that's it. You know, I can't learn anymore. 
that hospital is in a green zone, yellow zone. I can't go five minutes to the supermarket alone because I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian. I can go on a 10K run every morning, but I can't walk five minutes to the supermarket alone, a 36 year old man, 35 at the time. What's that all about? So, but it was all right, because I could work with Edouard, work with Volva, Igor, with Dima, um, and I could learn. So that was a month. Um, then another month I go to the front with them to live in a house, and I'm the only foreigner. Edouard was, it was me and Edouard, the hospital had never seen foreigners. The front on the Zaporizhia line had not seen any foreigners, except some Azov boys I'd met coming and going. Georgian Legion. If you want to count Georgians as foreigners here, I, I really wouldn't, because they're, they're such a part of the scene, the war. Um, but when you go to the front, so if it's a triangle, this is the base of the triangle, and the hospital is the point at the top, which naturally receive the casualties. But the front can't pop all day long, all week long. So different different ambulance points, different casualty evacuation points would not see casualties for a day or two, maybe a week. Um, maybe the people at Hulipuli were getting rocked, but we can't abandon our area to go help them. So, so you know, sometimes I'd be waiting around this house uh, five days, I think, at the longest, we wouldn't see anything. Uh, now, I always wanted to learn. I wanted to learn more, watching YouTube videos, North American Rescue, which is a great resource. Um, and, and one day, my friend Rebecca and I were talking. Um, phone signal's very slow there. Um, and she said, oh, we've had some quiet days. So we're training. We're going through a march algorithm. We're doing this and that. Uh, I'm teaching people. I got upset. I've got Dima, who doesn't speak a word of English, anesthesiologist, brilliant. He's always willing to help me. But I got this woman who speaks pretty good English, who's playing Candy Crush on her phone all day, waiting in this house. Julia, can you teach me? What do you want to learn, Brandon? I said, well, why am I watching YouTube videos when I've got you here with all this experience and we've got fuck all to do? Well, you know everything. I don't. I bloody well don't know everything. Um, well, medicine is very broad. You need to tell me what you need to learn. So, okay. Can, can we go over more about airways? Uh, can I learn about like signs of internal bleeding to identify? Well, yes, maybe, but you need to tell me what you need to know about this. Can you not make this any fucking easier? Not only her, but many Ukrainians, many former communists, like the company I work for in Sweden, they're Estonian, my direct manager. You can't ask broad questions. You have to learn to pull the right string. It's like, ooh, pulled the right one this time, and then ask another question. It's very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. So one day it's quiet, and she's teaching TCCC classes. Uh, to local army units and uh, I said can I go with you well, well you don't speak Russian so I was like can I go with you um, yes okay you know don't don't just leave the foreigner locked in the cupboard um, and uh, I went with them I watched it was very verbal it wasn't very hands-on which I don't agree with that type of instruction but anyway on the walk back um, I said, okay, now you've got your boots on before we settle down for the day or the afternoon. Um, can we go through a march algorithm? You know, 20 minutes, can we, can we go through? No, Brandon, I'm tired. I said to her, I said, you know, I, I'm here to learn and I'm here to serve. Um, and, and it seems that you're not here to help me, to help Ukraine. Uh, I'll do one more rotation with you, but if it's like this all the time, I'm going to another crew. Brandon, you do not make ultimatums to me. For four days, she wouldn't speak to me. The driver, her boyfriend, partner, he wouldn't speak to me. So that's me cut off from the English language for about four days. And all I have is a dog and Johnny Cash. It's very, very lonely, it's very lonely. Now, now during that whole time, uh, on the month on the front, I started Instagram to fundraise for helmets for us. 
Now, I thank the first 4,000 followers personally with a one minute voice message. Some of you who watch this will remember because I, I believe that's something I can do to make this war personal. Um, she thought it all very bizarre. Now, I'm very limited for my content when I'm stuck between two buildings and there's drones flying around and, and you can't film casualties when we get them. You know, so I had to be creative with the dogs, the toilets, the, but to thank everyone. She thought it very bizarre. They said to me, you know, you need to watch out for your mental health. You know, you're gonna burn yourself out. Well, I'm a high functioner, like Rebecca. Um, I don't think it's fair for you to judge me on the same, on the same terms as you judge yourself, who, who plays Candy Crush all day. Um, that might sound arrogant, but I, I, I work harder than most people I've met in the world. Um, I'm, I'm willing to do more. Um, but, you know, it was very difficult. Um, I, think, I think all the hipsters and the new age people call it gaslighting. Uh, I think that's the term. And, and I really had myself questioning myself, you know, it's just, well, she's an experienced Ukraine veteran or she's been wounded here and she's back again. You, you can't question that mode of Brandon, like they're beyond reproach. Um, but I know that's bullshit now because like I, I've got a brain injury and drive over some mines, which some people think is a really big deal. And, but I, I know I'm a flawed human being. So now, now I have that from personal experience to deal with. So there was a, um, there was a battle on the Zaporizhia line. There was a planned attack against Russian positions. Now, when we go on the offensive, the body count soars. Apparently that's going on in Kherson right now. I know I have friends from hospitaliers who've gone down there right now to serve and there's gonna be a lot of bodies. Um, when we had the, just the one day, uh, the worst day of that, uh, 63 300s, it was bad. Um, like 25, 30 dead. Um, we were on a medical stabilization point that was set up. Uh, we were there to assist and casualties would roll in, roll out. The commander, Igor, you can look back at my post, you've seen Igor, I brought them a generator. He's a Ukrainian army surgeon of 30 years. You know, he could have made big money gone private. Uh, he served Ukraine. He, he's been on UN missions. He, he's led the medical effort on UN missions in Lebanon. He was so pro-Westerner. Not every Ukrainian is. Um, when I was there, it was like a breath of fresh air. There was, there was, it was three people that spoke English. Um, they were so welcome. Let's get to work. And, and you know, with Julia, she did nothing. She did fuck all. Um, but there was quiet times, so I'd, I'd find things to do. Uh, sort boxes of syringes, sort sort gauze, move it from this box so it was all by size, so it was easier that they didn't have to fuck around. We got very busy there sometimes. But, uh, you know, in quiet times like that, she'd yell at me, what are you doing? So I kind of extracted myself from the team and I just went and stacked bodies. Uh, I just, I went and got on the ambulances, like at the hospital. There was enough work with just scissors a lot of the time. The odd bandage, um, the odd hemostatic gauze, you know, like uh, plug and wounds. Not a lot of that, but just mostly scissors. <sighs> I tried my best, but I was with this woman who was lazy, uh, was critical of everything I ever tried to do. Uh, I, I think this is called gaslighting and had me questioning myself. <coughs> and I was very worried uh, because I'm a foreigner. What, what ground do I have to stand on? I wanted out of this team. I wanted away from her. But what she tells the commanders in Russian or Ukrainian, I am powerless over. Um, I very much wanted to stay in battalion and serve, but with, with more productive people. Um, with with more dedicated people. Um, but my, my two months with her, um, I find myself raging inside. Um, you know, my fundraising efforts was originally for helmets. She said, get us a four wheel drive. Okay, I'll whore myself out on the internet for this. Um, what did she do? Nothing. What did she do with me? Question my, my means every time how I go about it. Um, I raised the money for a four-wheel drive. 
Um, we, we stayed in Zaporizhia with a night with a guy, Henrik. Um, he, he owns a, um, he, he a business. They make models, Warhammer, nerd stuff. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Trekkie. Um, he donated $2,000 to our four-wheel drive effort. Um, I didn't know he gave it to them in cash. Um, I don't know where that money went, but I've never seen it. And, and uh, I've, I've since purchased two four-wheel drives. Uh, I went to Germany to get them. Um, that money just went... I questioned what happened every time. I questioned, like, the past. Like, was that real? You know, like, are people actually like that? Um, you know, in their own country? Um, that they either don't care, uh, they want to play Candy Crush when people are dying around them or they could prepare to better handle people dying around them. And, um, you know, by and large, uh, the battalion is fantastic. Uh, hospitalieri, volunteers, Ukrainian anesthesiologists, neurosurgeons who somehow learn to work on an ambulance and do it well, EMTs, paramedics, drivers, gunners, they... You know, they form these really good teams that stay together. They have to break up because they're volunteer. People's financial situations are different. Foreigners have to come and go. Um, but I'm on this team and it's my only reference. And, and, and this is the Ukraine war. Um, what is my part in it? You know, um, this was very damaging. I. It was only until Dima had left the team, after I left, um, it was only on their next rotation that I knew the team they went over to, which was very competent, uh, Swedish and Ukrainian, and I know those people and I trust those people. I, I came to Ukraine with, with two of them, um, and, and I know their level of proficiency and competency and, and the Ukrainians on the team and the synergy they have. I, I, I so wanted to be part of that team. Um, that when my old teammates came to their position in Kharkiv, it was the same shit. Um, do, okay, we're gonna take you around, show you the area of responsibility. No, not interested, we're gonna rest. We're gonna introduce you to all the casualty collection points, show you the route to the hospital, show you where the mines are. When we went to the front, the Georgian Legion offered to show us all of that. She didn't wanna know didn't want to know one bit. You're an ambulance crew and you don't want to know the roads. You don't want to know what battalion is here, what brigade is operating there. You don't want to know where the fucking mines are. Your guns aren't even sighted. You don't want to go to a range for two hours. She did the same shit. Now, I wasn't there, but a doctor, a, a 68 whiskey, trained medic that's an american medic he went to train with america in america a ukrainian he trained hundreds of ukrainian medics was on another team and and they're driving down a road and he hits a mine and is vaporized a hero of ukraine and she's in the ambulance behind with max and whoever's on their crew now and they get damaged no one was hurt she runs from her ambulance, which is in the rear. He, he detonated an anti-tank mine. She runs. They leave their guns. They leave everything. That's bad. That's bad. And she gets injured. Not by the blast, as I found out. She falls over and breaks her legs, the fat cunt, fat useless cunt. And she gets taken away to hospital. She makes out like she's wounded in war. Um, the battalion commander gives her a couple thousand dollars to help with her recovery and she goes on social media and talks about how she did everything right but war is war and, and she asks for more money, okay, and she doesn't even mention the doctor who died in the ambulance in front. She falls and breaks her legs because she falls over because she's never done PT in her life. So she's got weak bones. She's surrounded by disgusting fat body. And, and she breaks her leg with her own stupidity. And, and she's asking for more money. And she doesn't even pay homage to the doctor who's actually done real. I don't know what she's done for Ukraine or not. Maybe she, ha maybe she was good back in the day. I, I didn't see it. Um, so I have rage. It's getting better and better. Um, I may open myself a reproach from this, but now that I'm a, I'm a hero, 
because I got, I got an eardrum blowing out, you know, trying to rescue babushkas and stuff, it's given me a little bit of social credit in Ukraine, you know? It's given me a bit of credit. There's people in the unit who I never talked to before, people who came, hospitalers who come visit me in Dnipro, you know, like one of them I knew, the other ones that giving me hugs, you know, like, uh, cause, cause I'm, I'm always insecure my whole life. I've been like, uh, my three is not good as someone else's two, right from the rugby team in school. I always had, I, I got hands the size of a girl to, uh, to learn to be a boxer. You know, like I, I've always had this insecurity inside of me. I have to do more, I'm not doing enough. Comes from an alcoholic family growing up and, and my mom, well, we'll talk about her someday. I never knew my mom, but, but so I'm not doing enough. Whenever in a situation, I always look at me first, the flaw, the flaw, like w what the situation, but I realize I have no part in that. I have, I have no part in that with her. Um, she's a lazy, lazy piece of shit. She'll never serve again. I know she won't. Um, and I've told people about this. Um, many people want to play war, um, but they don't really want to do it. Um, you know, that's where my PTSD comes from. The rage, the incompetency, uh, the indifference. Now I've served with many heroes here, real heroes. I, I'm never gonna call myself a hero. Um, I have friends who died here and I just, yeah, I'm gonna stay in Ukraine and I'm gonna do the best I can. Um, this video was gonna be about me getting my residency. Uh, I'm going to Poland on September 7th. I've got, um, I've got an appointment uh, with the Ukrainian embassy in Krakow because you have to go abroad to get it. Um, I'm going to go to Poland for about five, six days. Come back here with my Ukrainian residency card. So I don't have to worry about that shit anymore. Um, yeah, that's good. You know, that's really good. Uh, the love and support I've received from people. Um, so many other things I wanted to talk about, but it doesn't really matter because we're 25 minutes in now. And I'm not the only person who's had this kind of experience before. Um, they said 80% of foreign volunteers who come to Ukraine were gone within the first two months. Uh, some of them, I really question their motives. The Lviv gunmen, I call them. Ex-Iraq veterans, uh, Afghanistan veterans, frauds. There's a fraud from my hometown who didn't even do a year in the army and he ended up in a fighting unit, he's gone now. Um, you know, there was a lot of that. People who want to fight, but they don't want to die. Um, I'm, I'm not looking to die here, but I don't, I'm, it's, it's not a, it's not a factor in my decisions of what I do here. Um, fatalism, but I'm just going to do the best I can. Uh, and I'm going to stay here. Um, but there was a lot of good foreigners, mostly on the medical side that I met because their motives were purer than the, the Lviv gunmen, okay? Um, and a lot of them burnt themselves out here with frustration because there's so many good Ukrainians, but there's so many that don't give a shit. Um, I'm not really doing much to help the blue and yellow brand, am I? But but at the end of the day, this war, it's it's... It's a human, it's a very human war. And there's human beings here uh, with all their goodness and all their badness. And, and I don't know where I fit on the category. I'm, I'm just, I'm not saying I'm good or bad. I'm just saying I'm trying. Um, but that's my mental health and that's my PTSD. Um, it's not the dead people, uh, you know, Solodar, some of those guys, like there's a guy, uh, Bryce Wilson, who's got a profile as a journalist, who's helping as a volunteer there now, and he's talking about some horrific shit, and it is horrific. Um, and they're all doing the best they can. Um, that doesn't bother me. Maybe it will someday, I don't know. But it's, I, I don't talk about my past, but I've got a very colorful past. And, and I think that's that's been a gift for, for me in Ukraine here. Um, I've had time to process through therapy, uh, through almost 11 years of sobriety and 12-step recovery. Um, yeah, so the war doesn't bother me. It's, it's, it was that experience. And um, 
yeah, I'm just going to stop there. This video was supposed to be about something else, but uh, but if people want to know about my PTSD, um, and I have to forgive her too, because she's just a human being. We're all human beings. I, I've done a lot of bad things, and I, but I'm just trying the best I can.